All right, so here's a video on um, classification taxonomy. If you're in the IB textbook, it's section 5.5. It's about classification. Here are the major topics that um, I'm going to talk about that you need and that you need to know and understand for the test. Um, you need to understand binomial nomenclature, the seven hierarchical levels, um, distinguishing um, characteristics, physical characteristics between the four major plant phyla and um, several of the animal phyla. Um, phyla is plural of phylum. I hope that rings a bell for one of the seven hierarchical levels. And um, lastly, dichotomous keys. So I'm going to put a little star. Let's see. I'll put a little star next to the ones that hopefully you already know something about. Um, either um, from previous years in life science and biology or um, based on what we've already used this year specifically in group four. So what I want you to do is um, make sure you're taking notes along with this video. Um, and then you could either use the note sheet that is provided to you or, or on your own either way, but um, make sure that you're also looking at leading questions um, and that you add to these notes later um, using your textbook. So. That being said, let's go and get started and and um, start immediately with binomial nomenclature. So, well, this is mostly, um, this should mostly be review. Um, and if I remember correctly, this is the first um, component or the first target for this section on classification. So if you remember correctly, by means two, nomial or nomen refers to names and nomenclature means naming system. So the binomial nomenclature is the two name naming system that we use um, in talking about specific um, species. You see the relationship between the word specific and species? Um, we're talking about a specific set of organisms. Make sure that you look up this word and that you know this word and you can spit out the definition of it just as IB wants you to know it. So um, the two names that we use are gen the organisms or the species genus and species. Those are the two names that we use. So for example, you know or I hope you know that our genus and species name is Homo sapiens. Um, now there are a couple rules that I hope you pick up on that we um, that I used when I wrote this, and that genus Homo comes always before the species name. The species is much more specific than the genus name or the genera. Genera is the plural of genus, um, and that we capitalize um, the first letter of the genus, but not so for the um, species name. And when we type these names, they're italicized. But when we handwrite them, what we need to do is make sure we underline them. Um, and now some of you know this already. Some of us used this in your IAs when you talked about the biological species that you used, which was fantastic because that this is what um, helps to communicate this communicates um, the organism to a worldwide community to a world wide community um, you know, I hope you know what common names are. It's what we call things commonly. Um, so, for example, in the the textbook talks about uh, pill bugs or so bugs or roly polies. Those are all common names. But if we were to talk to somebody across the pond, um, the Atlantic Ocean pond, um, they may not call them the same thing. So we need to use a, a universal name, and that's this binomial nomenclature. And sometimes it's referred to as the Latin name, um, which simply people use for shorthand for saying binomial nomenclature, um, 
but there's a problem with that in that some or actually many many actually have Greek origins Greek word names so that's what this means um, homo sapiens is actually not Latin it comes from Greek so um, just be mindful that there isn't one language um, let's see so let's talk a little bit about so I hope you know just as a quick review who um, who was involved with this and that um, that Linnaeus um, Linnaeus is credited with giving us um, this system of binomial nomenclature although the, he wasn't the first to use the genera name um, he was the one first to use it consistently for all of the organisms that he was being given and this was a huge deal at the time when he was working and rather most of um, human history biology was simply classifying organisms trying to figure out how this wide variety of organisms might be grouped um, and identified and understood in um, as far as an organization system goes and that's all um, that binomial nomenclature really um, that's where binomial nomenclature grew out of. But there are a couple of really positive and uh, meaningful things that binomial nomenclature does beyond what was already set up in the previous system. And there's a list of this in, the, in your book. Um, and I've alluded to one of these already. Um, and this is just one way to do it. Um, binomial nomenclature in this system is, only, is one way to organize... Um, living thing. So th again, this is like the definition of species. This is our framework. This is how we interpret the world of all of the different variety of living things, of all of the diversity, biodiversity that there is. We have to come up with a way to organize it. And this is one way that we organize it, is using um, our classification system of living things. But what's interesting is that Linnaeus set up a system in which we can show evolutionary relationships. So even though binomial nomenclature is only using the genus and the species, which is the most specific um, information for an organi organization, it's not our complete name, it's not any organism's complete name. Um, so there are other terms that, you, that we use to organize individuals, or sorry, individual populations um, and the more of those that they have in common starting from the most broad category the more closely related they are so we're the only ones on earth today that um, have the genus homo but that doesn't mean that's always that was always the case we're the only ones who are surviving today excuse me um, so you might have heard of other hominid species like homo habilis, homo erectus um, Homo floriensis, uh, many other um, species within the Homo genus. Um, well, that means that we're much more closely related, that we have a much more common ancestor than something with a different genus name. Um, for example, Australopithecus, which is what Lucy was. Um, Lucy was of the genus Australopithecine, which has a further common ancestor than other species within the homo genus. We'll come back to that in a few minutes to make sure that you understand. Um, and then the other thing that w which is cool, um, which science and theories um, allow us to do, is make predictions. You might think, well, isn't this all stuff of the past and the present? Yeah, but this allows us to make predictions of shared characteristics. So if organisms or populations and species, okay, I can't spell, um, that's not right, okay, let me stop talking, characteristics, okay, um, so if organisms have much more common, much more recent common ancestors, they probably have, uh, they will have more similar DNA, which means that they code for similar proteins, they have similar characteristics, they lived in 
similar environments, so they may have similar behaviors. Um, there's just more similarities if they show share much more recent common ancestors. So our classification system is based on those evolutionary relationships. And the other thing that's kind of cool is that because this is our way to organize living things, um, this is always changing. That doesn't mean that species are changing drastically. It just means that the way that we organize them changes as we learn more about them. So organisms might move from one class or maybe one family to another family. Excuse me, based on some new data um, that we might have found. So. Let's talk about this on a, large, on a slightly larger scale and talk about the, the seven hierarchical classification um, classifications of living things. Um, so let's do let's. so these are terms of hierarchy in our classification system. Um, and notice I'm leaving a little bit of space here, and I'm going to write um, kingdom. I hope this is jogging some bells. Uh, what is that? I don't know what that means. I apologize. It's 4 a.m. I hope that some rings, some bells are going off, um, and that you're remembering some of this material from previous years. Kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, and species. So remember, the ones we were just talking about are those two. This is what um, Linnaeus used um, in giving that scientific, quote-unquote, Latin name to organisms so that every person, every scientist around the world knows um, what organism we're talking about. So you have to know this order. You have to know kingdom, phylum, kingdom, class, order, family, genus, species. And you might remember this from... Ninth grade or seventh grade, and your teacher might have told you you could remember King Philip came over for a great spaghetti, um, a great salad, great I don't know what what you want to remember, um, but you can come up, or how you want to remember this, but um, you can come up with your own system for um, remembering this. But this is the order. So the idea here, and this is nicely, I think this is a pretty good illustration on page one fifty five of your textbook of this branching tree. I guess it's upside down. You start with one kingdom at the top, and it breaks down into the different phyla. Then we've got classes, order, family, genus, and species. And as you move down, as you move down, um, it becomes more specific. And that's easy to remember because species is at the very bottom. So we have only a few types, of, a few kingdoms um, that I be that that we have. Um, and so, here, let's, let's talk about those for a quick second. So the kingdoms, there are five that IB thinks that there are. Um, we're going to talk about some of these in a second. The plant kingdom. The animal kingdom. The protist kingdom. Or protista kingdom, the fungi kingdom, and the prokaryotes. Kingdom. So you've heard of these before, I hope. Um, and I hope you also realize that these are just um, different categories, although they do all still interact within a food web and ecosystem. Um, these are just different kingdoms. Um, I also tell you that when my parents were in high school, they learned that there were two kingdoms and there were just plants and animals and all living things fit into that. We've learned more. We know more about the differences between different species and the evolutionary relationships between them. So now we've broken them up into these five. Well, these five are actually um, are out of date. IB wants you to know these five, but we know that the prokaryotic kingdom um, actually is divided into two. We've got eukaryotes and archaea, 
I mean, sorry, we've got eubacteria and archaea as two different types of prokaryotes. Archaea living in extreme environments um, and eubacteria really being the bacteria that we usually think about that live on us, in us, in our environment. Um, but those are both types of prokaryotic cells. You should also know that a little bit beyond what IB wants you to know that we, are, we actually have above kingdoms we have domains um, and there are subcategories for all of these um, we could have subspecies, subfamilies, suborders um, it just adds another layer of classification um, but what I want you to think about is the definition of a species and see if you can figure out what is meant by this term subspecies so figure out what that term means and see if that um, makes sense to you or not um, but I think it's kind of an interesting idea so we're gonna in a few minutes we're gonna um, actually we're gonna go ahead and do this now we're going to talk about certain phyla so certain phyla of the plant and animal kingdom so plants and animals actually differ all the way back to the at the kingdom level but they're both in the same domain of the of eukarya or having eukaryotic cells um, so they have a much further back in evolutionary time common ancestor than um, each of the plant phyla have from each other because the phyla the plant phyla all have the same kingdom have different phyla therefore a different class a different order a different family a different genus and different species however sometimes they can have the same species names because Whoever discovers them gets to name them. Um, but this is just an individual identifier. So if they have different classes and orders, families, and gene, genus, but the same species, that's just coincidence. They've got to have all of the previous classifications um, the same in order to um, be closely related. So um, as we move on, you, sh you should know that you have to remember, um, you have to know two different, organisms of different kingdoms um, their whole classification system from kingdom all the way down to species so um, they do the full um, classification of humans and peas um, uh, in your book not I would recommend that you look at those two because uh, those that's the species of peas that Mendel worked with that's and, the, and then we have there's us um, which might make it easier to remember um, but if that doesn't work for you Pick organisms on your own. And pick something that you're likely to remember. Okay? Um, and there's a nice little section in the book that I would just want to point out about um, other ways of classifying organisms. So we can use the system, but we actually technically use um, some other systems as well. But we don't, it doesn't give us the same information, it doesn't give us evolutionary relationships. So we could go with um, feeding, which, you know, if it is an herbivore or carnivore, um, we can go by habitat. What kind of house does it live in? Does it dwell? Does it not? Um, does it live in the water? Does it terrestrial? Can it fly? Um, it's daily activity. Um, is it diurnal or nocturnal? Um, we could go by anatomy, which I think kind of does fit into what we have right now at one level. Um, does it, is it a vertebrate or invertebrate? And if you don't know what that means, pause and Google it. Um, but this is, this would be a difference at the phylum level, um, We've got, we've got um, one phylum of chordata, and they would have vertebra, um, whereas the other phylum may not. And again, we're going to talk a little bit about that now. Okay, um, so let's talk about plant phyla. Um, I guess let's go down. Again, I apologize. Uh, it's early. I hope that this makes some sense to you. That looks like nice, nice green here. Alright, because I think of plants. I think of green when I think of 
plants. Um, all right, so let's learn how to spell Mr. Patel. Okay, plant phyla. So there are many different um, kinds of plants, but there are four major phyla that you need to know. Um, and I guess we can just do let's let's do a chart. I apologize, I can't do straight lines very well yet with this. So um, we'll do bryophyta. So don't confuse phyta with phyla. Phyta refers to, just means plant. Uh, refers to plants. Then we've got um, phyllinocinophyta. That's a hard one to say. Um, we've got coniferophyta and we have um, angiospermophyta. So those are the four major phyla that you need to know. And what you also need to know is characteristic um, differences amongst them that you could identify, um, that you can notice in these organisms to put them into one of these four phyla. So I want to make sure that we we have we understand what these are. So let's give a let's talk a little bit about some examples so that you understand this a little bit better um, and know what we're talking about. So some examples of bryophytes are mosses and liverworts. Um, the the phyllocinophytas um, are the ferns and horsetails. The coniferophyta are the conifers, or look at the beginning of this term, cone, and angiosperm are flowering plants. So um, there are some key differences in the vegetative um, characteristics here, and I'm what I'm. I'm hoping to do is a little bit of a review of, or uh, connections rather to some other content that we've talked about this year um, that might help you as um, our IB exam approaches. So you need to know the vegetative characteristics and reproductive characteristics. So let's do vegetative first. This is basically um, the the physical differences between them, not the way that they, not in the way that they reproduce, but some other things. So, um, what you should know is that this is also the order that we think that these plants um, first came about. Um, remember, uh, we talked about speciation in class. So we think that the moss and liverworts were um, have a much well speciated from what was to become each of these other four phyla uh, much earlier in time um, and part of that thinking is based on their characteristics and their reproductive methods and that they're not as advanced as the others. So the bryophytes um, are what are considered non-vascular. So if you think about vascular, you should think of cardiovascular, you should think of um, vascular tissue, um, Essentially, these mosses and liverworts have to live very, they're, they're not tall, they have to live very close to the ground or wherever they're getting the nutri nutrients from simply because um, they don't have the vascular tissue to move things far away. So we'll talk about that in just a second when we talk about the other three. So when we think about um, the the ferns and the conifers and the angiosperms, we think of things that are actually taller. Um, the conifers are probably the tallest, but the ferns and horsetails 
if you go walking through Reston, the woods in Reston, you'll see fern um, on the sides of the paths. These ferns are not laying flat on the ground. They actually can stand tall. Um, and that's because they are vascular, um, which means that they have these two tissues, xylem and phloem. And you may have heard of these before. You may not have. Um, but the xylem carry water, um, and the phloem carry uh, food. So a good way to remember that is the sounds phloem and food, and xylem is uh, carries water. So it's W X Y, W from water, and then X Y go together. I don't know. Whatever helps. Um, but if you think about these plants. Um, plants do the process of, I'm just going to do some, a little something over here on the side. They do photosynthesis. This is a little bit of the review. They do photosynthesis. Photo meaning light. They create sugars from light and carbon dioxide in the air and water from the ground. So these vascular plants that have leaves that are higher up, they're competing, they're, they're out competing the mosses and the liverworts for sunlight. Um, need to be able to get water up to their leaves and it happens through the xylem. So water gets absorbed at the roots of these plants um, and they travel up through the xylem. Now the way that water travels up a xylem is through capillary action which is cohesion and adhesion combined um, when water bonds to other polar molecules. Well the xylem is made out of a molecule that we've talked about over and over again, which is cellulose, also found in the cell wall of plant cells. Um, and cellulose is a polysaccharide of many glucose molecules, and it's polar. Um, by the way, cellulose is the same thing that makes up paper towels and allows uh, paper towels to soak up water. Paper towels are not so good at soaking up oil, which is nonpolar, but we can use paper towels to um, pick up excess um, oil but it's not behaving in the same way as water does with the paper towel. When the plants make their glucose up in their leaves they have to to uh, move that glucose to every single cell in its structure so into the roots into the, the stem and it pumps down the glucose in the form of a disaccharide usually a sucrose um, down the trunk or stem of this of um, plants so they can be stored in other places. So remember that plants don't do photosynthesis all year round. If you remember the winter, um, most of our trees were not green. So they weren't doing photosynthesis, they didn't have leaves, um, but they had to still make ATP from the glucose that they had made during the spring, summer, and fall. Um, and most plants store that extra food down below underground in their roots. Um, which, by the way, gives them an the evolutionary advantage of having bigger roots because then they get more um, water and minerals for the next season, um, and it allows them to anchor into the ground. So the other thing that's kind of cool to know about the vascular tissue from an evolutionary point of view is that it allowed plants to stand up taller to outcompete for sunlight, but it also um, created deep root systems. Um, which we see with some ferns, but we see mostly with conifers and the angiosperms, these deep root systems. And this is why um, when the earth is no longer covered, or part of the reason why earth is no longer covered everywhere by water, um, these roots, by preventing erosion, um, were able to create rivers because it removed um, and prevented the soil from eroding into a flat surface and was able to maintain the structure of some areas um, and allowing water to flow downhill rather than on a flat surface. And I hope that makes sense. It's because the roots are able to hold on to the ground. Um, okay, so that's the main vegetative thing um, for the ferns, but that's the same for the conifers and for, let me get my green back, it's the same thing for the conifers and the angiosperms. They have vascular tissue, um, and that's why they're able to stand upright. What we also need to know are the reproductive characteristics.
Remember, it's all about reproduction, survival and reproduction. So, bryophytes um, don't make, so no flowers, no flowers, no seeds, um, but instead they make spores. Um, so moss makes spores which trans are transported by water. Remember, they're low down to the ground. They have to get their water and do photosynthesis um, in cells that are very close to each other because they lack vascular tissue. Um, so they're very much on the ground, and that rainwater and um, and that rainwater carries spores from one location to another. Um, so which is, which is kind of neat um, because it's very different than what we understand. But this is the same for um, the ferns. So we think that they that because the moss don't have vascular tissue and reproduce by spores, they came before the ferns that still lack seeds and flowers. Um, but do have vascular tissue. The vascular tissue provide them an evolutionary advantage. The thing about spores is that they are diploid, not haploid. Seeds are, are zygotes um, or embryo of um, sexually reproducing plants. Um, so when spores are diploid, that actually reduces the amount of genetic variation that is inherent in a, or in a population that sexually reproduces. So you, I know you don't think about sex in plants, but, um, or maybe, maybe you do. Um, but the mosses and liverworts are not doing that because they're making spores. Um, but the conifers do something very different. And if hopefully you know that they have pine cones and there are male and female pine cones. Um, and a single tree could have both male and female pine cones. Um, and they make pollen. You see that a lot in the environment now, the yellow stuff that's... Um, we actually have a very high pollen count in the air right now. Um, but if we were to look at the pollen, we would be able to identify what species this pollen comes from and use that as evidence of what kinds of plants are around. Um, but there is wind pollination. So it's kind of random um, when we think of the conifers and the, the way that they um, reproduce. But think about pine cones um, as an example. So um, some of the vegetative characteristics might be that actually um, needles, pine needles, um, they're not big, broad, flat leaves. They are needle-like. So think of um, firs and spruces and um, pine trees as our examples of of conifers. Um, let's see, and then we've got angiosperms. Um, oh, sorry, this is sexually reproducing. So, just want to make sure I I wrote that. So you wrote that. Um, and then this is also the angiosperms are also sexually reproducing. And they make flowers. Anything with flowers that, when pollinated, become fruit. Don't know if you know that. Fruit come from fertilized flowers. Um, and they're usually pollinated by animals. Um, or insect. Or, so it could be um, birds or insects. So what's interesting about this is that, um, and just to make another connection, I hope I hope that you're finding that interesting and good for review. That there's a process of coevolution happening between birds and flowers, or even bees and flowers. Um, so let's let's talk a little bit about that. Um, co means together. So they're evolving together. 
So um, what that means is that there are organisms or po certain specific pollinators that have certain characteristics that are closely tied to the characteristics of the flowers. Remember, it's all about survival and reproduction. What flowers are trying to do, not obviously not intentionally or not consciously, but what has worked for them to um, survive and reproduce till, until today is that they've got certain traits that promote reproduction. So remember that flowers have are sex, are sex organs that have um, that have male gametes and female gametes and they're trying to recombine to make new variations and they use the pollinators um, by luring them in with nectar to carry their pollen from one flower to another to fertilize another flower of the same species. So um, as a flower gets better um, or able to call in more pollinators, um, it's going to have more reproductive success than a flower that of the same species that doesn't have that quality. Um, same with the, the insects. The insects, the birds and the bees are all about um, their own reproductive success as well. They're not mindful of it, but they're a product of it. Um, so, for example, bees are going to the nectar to get honey for their offspring. Um, so they'll eat the nectar at the flowers, um, unintentionally take pollen on their hairs um, to another flower, um, and, and then take all that nectar back to their, um, to their hive, throw up that nectar into the form of honey, store that honey for the embryo, which is really part of their reproductive success. Right, so um, we have them; these flowers and insects evolve in different ways. Um, for example, there are flowers that have really long um, bases to them, um, and in fact, Darwin predicted this: um, that there must be some kind of insect that's able to feed it the nectar that's way at the bottom of this flower, and a specific insect. And he never saw this insect, but this is huge moth that's got a proboscis or a nose-like thing that um, can wind up into this nice little coil, but when it's feeding, it extends it, and it's lo just long enough to get to the bottom of these flowers. If there wasn't an insect that was a, that had that feature, then we wouldn't see those flowers today. So that's all coevolution co is, but we see that specifically here because it's the interaction of two species, or several species, but one, flower, one species of flower, one species of pollinator that interact with each other. Um, there's also a flower that produces um, the smell of rotting flesh, um, which is not trying to attract birds or, or bees, or instead it's attracting flies, in which, remember, flies lay their maggots or their offspring in decaying flesh or rotting flesh. So that's what the flowers are trying to do, is lure in those flies that will take their pollen um, from that flower to another flower of the same species cross-pollinating those individuals. Um, and what they're doing is fooling those flies into thinking this would be a good place to lay eggs for the next generation. Again, it's all about surviving and reproducing. Alright, so I realize I've been talking at you for 38 minutes, 39 minutes now. Um, so I'm going to actually let you um, let you do some research um, and apply this kind of thing to the animal phyla. Um, but one of the leading questions asks you to make a tree, an evolutionary tree. So let me show you um, what I'm talking about. Um, so let's say that this um, is an evolutionary tree. The y-axis is time. Time is increasing as we are becoming more and more recent as we go up into time. Um, as we go to the top of this chart, and um, this line just represents the trajectory. And what we know is that the most advanced or most complex organisms based on this plant um, chart are the angiosperms. And so we're going to put we're going to put them up at the top. angiosperms and then the other the next most complex are the conifers or the coniferophyta um, 
But notice that I drew that arrow up to the same height as far as time because they're alive today. Um, and then what we could have here are the ferns. And way back here, we've got our mosses. So what I want to point out is what this indicates right here is that not that angiosperms evolved from conifers and conifers from ferns, but instead that there's a common ancestor that's speciated into these two different populations. Um, same here. So angiosperms and conifers also have another have other common ancestors that are represented by this this diagonal line that goes up up into the right, but this is the most recent common ancestor that speciated into these two different populations and species. This is a common ancestor for ferns, and then this group of um, sexually reproducing plants that make pollen, um, and then this is a common ancestor to all vascular plants. Excuse me, this is a common ancestor to all vascular plants. This is a common ancestor to all of these plant phyla. I hope that makes sense. Now what I want you to do is do the same thing for the animal phyla that you're responsible for. And here's, let me make the list in case you don't know. Um, I think this is in your state, your um, curricular statement. Periphera, Nidaria, the sea is silent, um, Platyhelminthes, Annelids, think of earthworms. Um, so it might be a good idea to think of some examples of these. We're not done yet. Mollusca, mollusks, and arthropods. So just to, as a quick um, overview, this I don't know if this helps, but sponges, um, animal sponges, not kitchen sponges. Animal sponges are in the king in the phyla periphera, but these are all in the animal kingdom. Nidaria are jellyfish. Platyhelminthes are flatworms or unsegmented worms. Annelids are segmented worms. They've got segments to them. Think of earthworms. Mollusks. Um, mollusks are those like snails, clams, octopi, um, things with that hard shell around them, essentially. Um, and then arthropods are those things that um, have that nice exoskeleton of chitin, um, which coincidentally is the same molecule that makes up the cell wall of the phyl of the fungi or the fungi kingdom. Um, but this includes insects, spiders, uh, crustaceans, um, that kind of thing. So I, what I want you to do is make sure you go through and make a list, something that's going to be useful to you in order to classify organisms. And we're going to spend some time practicing this. Okay, so I'm going to, so I would say pause and do that. And then I'm going to go on real quick and talk about dichotomous keys. And I hope this is quick. All right. Dichotomous. All right. Again, it's early. I apologize. Dichotomous keys. feel like a dummy right now. Apologize. Okay. Dichotomous keys. Di means two. Cotomy means choices or two choice. So there are two choices for each level of a dichotomous key. So essentially what you're doing is um, creating or using a chart um, in the situation when you have an unknown organism not unknown to the scientific world. It's not a brand new newly discovered organism. It's unknown to you individually. So you, what you're trying to do is you come across this weird organism. Let's say you're walking on rest and you come across a, an insect or a plant that you don't know what it is. Now you're looking at that organism and using a dichotomous key to identify it. Um, not classify it, just identify it. Um, and we use these in our group four project, but essentially what this is, um, is a flow chart 
although it's not always written as a flow chart, but for each um, branch in a flow chart, there are going to be two decisions to make, and you have to decide which way to go. And sometimes um, some of the branching patterns end earlier than others, and that's just the way that things are organized. So let's say, you know, I'm looking at the pair, my pairs of shoes, uh, the and trying to to create a dichotomous key based on those. Well, the first decision I might make is that are they, and it's very it's very important to make very clear distinctions and distinctions that may not change over time. Um, so from season to season, or from childhood or adolescence to adulthood, when we think about living things. Um, so if I'm looking at my shoes, I might want to look at are they are they is it single colored or multicolored shoes? And if I deviate, if I come across one pair of shoes and I see that they are multicolored, I might go down one path and shut off this other path. I know that my shoe doesn't belong on this side of the chart, and I would answer the next series of questions of um, does it have laces or no not have laces? If it has laces, I might go down this direction um, and see that um, I need to make another call of um, is it a high top or a low top? Um, and I might get to the end here that tells me if I get to this point right here, it might it will tell me the specific name of that organism. Um, and that's essentially how a dichotomy key works, but when you go out in the field and you've got hundreds and hundreds of organisms, this is not going to be useful to you, even though it's easy to understand. You're not going to have a piece of paper big enough to make sense of out in the wild, or out in the woods, or wherever you are. So really, the way that this gets translated is into a series of statements. So here is the first choice. So um, is it unicolored? That's choice A, or is it choice B where it's multicolored? And I said my shoe is multicolored. So unicolored might tell you to go on to choice number two, but the multicolored might tell you to go on to choice number four. Well, mine's multicolored, so I'd skip to, which would have, again, two choices. I'm not even going to look at that. Or three. It's telling me to skip those. I go straight on to number four that's telling me to make another decision about my shoe um, which is laces or no laces. Does that make sense? And if it's no, if it's got laces I might go on to number five and if it's got no laces I might go on to number eight. And I follow that key going making one choice at a time telling me what number to go to and I might eventually come up to um, number seven that tells me a or if I got choice A or B, and that's um, are they um, Nike brand or um, not Nike? Then, if that's the choice, then it might tell me that these are my running shoes. Um, and if they're not, I might be told to go to number nine. I don't know. And so that's when I when it gives me the specific name, I've hit the end point of this chart, giving me the specific specific name of the organization. I just use shoes because they're pretty easy. They're they don't run away from you. Um, but then again, this is just a way to organize um, and identify organisms. This doesn't show any evolutionary relationships. This doesn't show um, or provide us any information to make predictions. It doesn't give us scientific names. Um, or the relationship between those, but it gives us a specific name to an unknown organism, an unknown organism that you or I don't know, but is known by the scientific community. Okay, so I see that my video is getting to 50 minutes, so I'm going to call that, uh, say that's done, um, and tell you that there are a few questions up on Blackboard to answer once you've done all this and the animal phyla to ensure that you really understand this content. Okay? Have a great weekend. Adios.